my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hump Palmer, and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. All right, a couple of quick announcements. We have our Know Your Options online childbirth course available right now at thebirthhour.com slash course, and you can use the coupon code 100OFF for $100 off your purchase. This is our comprehensive childbirth education that takes you from the final weeks of pregnancy all the way through obviously preparing for your birth and then support for postpartum with newborn care and for yourself. And then with that, you get an entire bonus course called Back to Work Breastfeeding that will teach you all about milk storage, optimizing pumping, and just preparing for that transition as well. So again, that information is at thebirthhour.com slash course, and you can use the coupon code 100 off for $100 off your purchase. And then as always, I want to say a big thank you to all of our listener supporters via Patreon. If you're new to the birth hour, you may not know that we have a Patreon group. You can find out more at patreon.com slash birth hour. This is the place where you can support the mission of the podcast while getting awesome perks like access to our archived episodes, membership in our private Facebook group, And then at the co-producer level, which is $10 a month, you'll get access to an entire second podcast that's every week, every Friday, we release these partner episodes where my husband interviews a partner about their perspective of pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. So you can find out all the information again at patreon.com slash birth hour or thebirthhour.com slash support. Today's episode is sponsored by Motif Medical. Motif designs insurance eligible products for busy moms. With a focus on innovation and empowerment, Motif's line of breast pumps and maternity compression garments are sophisticated yet discreet and made to support mothers as they navigate new motherhood. Discover why moms are reporting more milk in less time with the Luna breast pump and see how you can get it covered through insurance at motifmedical.com slash birth hour. At the end of this episode, I'll have more information about the Luna Breast Pump from Motif Medical. Today's birth story guest is Hannah. Hannah shares a little bit about some medical issues that she had before getting pregnant and then talks about being pregnant as an emergency room nurse during the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as her cesarean birth. All right, let's get to Hannah's birth story. Hi, Hannah. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hi, Bryn. Thank you for having me. Can you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah, so I am 25 years old and I'm married to my husband, Luke. We've been married for about two years. We live in Dayton, Oregon, which is a pretty small town. We've got a dog, Harold, a cat, Howard, and now our new baby girl named Rosemary. And I'm an emergency department nurse in one of the bigger hospitals here. And my husband is an agricultural financial loan analyst. In our free time, we are usually fishing. Mm, That sounds nice. I miss our fishing days in Oregon. Oh, yeah. There's great fishing here. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, let's start with your journey to becoming pregnant first. Okay. So my husband and I, we've been together since 2012, but only married for two of the years. And when we first got married, I thought, oh, I want, you know, like four years until we try to have babies because I just thought, you know, we need to have some time together. But in March of 2018, so we got married in July. So kind of right after that, I started having some pelvic pain and you know, I wasn't really sure what it was. So I went in to get things looked at and I ended up having a pretty large size cyst. I think it was like six centimeters. It was pretty big. And they thought at first that it was on my ovary, but it ended up being on my fallopian tube. So when they did surgery to remove it, they ended up having to remove my fallopian tube as well, 
because there was just too much damage done. So they left some tissue to keep the ovary connected. So I was really happy I didn't have to lose both ovaries. But through this process, my husband and I started talking about if we should start trying to have babies. And, you know, it wasn't something I thought we would talk about that quickly into our marriage, but it kind of scared us knowing that, you know, we could potentially struggle. And so we went through kind of a few more months and I recovered and we went through the summer and I just tried to convince him like every day, let's try to have a baby. So finally in December, we tried and we were lucky and got pregnant on our first try. Wow. I thought that was a relief after going through all of the medical stuff that was unexpected. Yeah, it was definitely. And I became kind of obsessed with getting pregnant and I'm working three 12 hour shifts. So at my shifts, I would just be sitting there thinking like, oh, I can't wait to take a test. I can't wait to take a test. And it kind of became something that I was obsessing over, which I know isn't always healthy, but I was just really, really excited and really worried at the same time. And so I had told myself that I was going to wait to take the test until the first day that I was supposed to get my period. But of course I was way too anxious. And so I took it two days prior and I was anxiously waiting, looking at the little lines, trying to see if they would make a positive and they did. And I think I had my husband convinced it was going to take us a while to get pregnant. So he was very shocked. I ran into the bedroom and he was in the attic because we're remodeling our house. And I was like, Luke, you need to come down here. And he was like, is everything okay? (laughs) I was like, yeah, but we're pregnant. And he was like, what? And shortly after that, we had delivery people coming to drop off our bed frame. So we didn't even get to talk (laughs) about it, but he was completely shocked. So it was kind of a surprise, but we were really excited. Okay. So then how did your pregnancy go? My pregnancy was wonderful. I loved being pregnant. And obviously that doesn't mean that I wasn't, you know, uncomfortable or sick. I think from about week six to 13, I was really nauseous and had a lot of food aversions. So I never threw up, which I tell people that and they're like, oh, I hate you. And I'm like, yeah, but I felt hung over every single day, very nauseous, very tired. Nothing sounded good except for your typical carbs or junk food, like pop tarts and toaster strudels and cereal and stuff I hadn't eaten in years. So of course I was wanting to eat healthy for my baby, but I was also just trying to eat anything I could to give myself energy. But, you know, I had some hip pain and back pain, of course, later on my second trimester, I felt a lot of energy, you know, like people say, you kind of get this energy because you're not super big and uncomfortable yet, but you're not very nauseous from the first trimester. So I really enjoyed it. And it was kind of a lot being on my feet at work, you know, three 12 hour days was definitely by the end of the day, I was working swing shift as well. So from 3 p.m. to 3 a.m. So I was pretty exhausted. And I'm naturally a very busy person and a very active person. So I was really thankful to still be able to go to the gym and do workouts throughout my pregnancy and do things like fish with my husband and go for bike rides. And, you know, there was nothing that uh, disabled me or made it to where I couldn't live life. Essentially, it was really, really enjoyable. And so, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing it again. (laughs) Right. And then what did you do to prepare for the birth and what type of birth were you planning for? It's so funny to think about this now because my birth ended up so different than I thought. But before I got pregnant, I was talking to one of my good friends who has been a great resource for me throughout all of pregnancy. And she was telling me about her birth story and, you know, she had an unmedicated birth. And in my head, I'm like, oh, why would you ever want to do that. Like, why wouldn't you want to just have an epidural? And I had done a few rotations on a labor and delivery floor as well as a student nurse and seen moms give birth medicated versus unmedicated. So really before I got pregnant, I thought like, Oh, I'll probably just, you know, get an epidural. But then once I got pregnant and I started listening to your podcast, because my friend suggested it to me, I became obsessed with your podcast, first of all. And I just listened to all these really awesome stories about moms giving birth unmedicated. And then I talked to my mom about her birth. She has 
five daughters. So I've got four sisters and she was unmedicated with all of them. And so I really started to think about it and process it. And I became really excited about the idea of trying to go without an epidural and trying to go as natural as possible. And being a nurse and understanding some of the medical sides to things, I wanted to give birth in a hospital for my first baby, just, you know, in case anything went wrong. And especially I was going to give birth at the hospital that I worked at. So I felt really comfortable with that. But I started listening to your podcast and I would go on walks and I would listen to it religiously. And then Rebecca Decker, the gal who she's been on your podcast before and has her website, an evidence-based website, and also a book. I read her book and I kind of looked some things up on her website. And then Ina May, I read her book. And I also, my husband and I purchased the Know Your Options childbirth course. So those are kind of some of the things we did to prepare. And it was just a lot of personal meditation, honestly. I mean, every day I would think about what it was going to be like for me to go into labor and to give birth. And I think at some point that can hinder you sometimes because you get so set on one thing and obviously birth is very unpredictable. But I was very excited to have the labor experience and very excited to do simple things like lose my mucus plug and get my cervix checked and have contractions. And I was like, I'm going to bounce on my ball and I'm going to bake cookies in early labor so that I can get through it because I've heard that you should do something that you enjoy and then do this, that, and the other. So I was really excited, but yeah, I just kind of mentally meditated on what I wanted birth to be like as much as I could. All right. And then do you want to talk anything else from your pregnancy that you want to focus on? I don't think so. It was pretty eventful, I guess. (laughs) All right. Well then how did labor start for you? Okay, so I guess this does tie in a little bit to things in my pregnancy that I forgot about. So at 20 weeks, when I went in for my anatomy scan, my husband couldn't go because it was kind of right in the middle of everything with COVID. So I guess maybe I should touch on that too. I was working in the emergency department during the COVID outbreak and all of that. And so that was something that was kind of scary in the beginning. Obviously it was scary for everyone, but especially being in my first trimester and being with my first baby, I was just really nervous about what was going to happen. But I started to just realize that, okay, I kind of have to get through this. I have to just continue to work and be as safe and protected as I can. So at 20 weeks, when I went in for my anatomy scan, I was really bummed my husband couldn't go. So that's, I think, when people were, you know, starting to do online appointments and stuff like that, which thankfully I never had to do. And I was able to go in in person for all my appointments, but my husband couldn't go. So I went and everything went well, but my OB had called me. He had called me right after, maybe the day after the appointment and told me that my baby had something called a choroid plexus cyst. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's technically a normal finding. But the reason that my OB wanted to tell me was because it can be a soft marker for trisomy 18. Um, Luckily, I did the genetic testing at around 13 weeks. And we knew that we had the lowest possible chance of our baby having trisomy 18. And everything else looked fine and healthy on her ultrasound. So he wasn't worried about that. He just needed to let me know that she had the cyst and that likely it would just disappear or, you know, not really have an effect. But it's basically a little pocket of fluid that develops in the choroid plexus in the brain. And so he offered me a second ultrasound at 31 weeks to see if it disappeared. And I wasn't really worried about if it had gone away or not, but I really wanted another opportunity for my husband to see our baby because he wasn't able to come to the anatomy scan. So at 31 weeks, we went in for the ultrasound and the ultrasound tech let us know that she was breech, which kind of stressed me out because it was my first pregnancy. And I thought, okay, you know, I'm in the thirties now. I feel like my baby should be head down getting ready. 
And everyone I talked to was like, don't worry, she'll flip. You know, most babies flip by week 36. It's not really a big deal. And so I was thinking about, you know, I looked up the spinning babies website and I looked at some of the like forward leaning inversion type positioning you could do. And I did a little bit of it for like a day or two. And then I thought, well, maybe I better just wait till 36 weeks. I don't want to ruin anything really. If she's in there and she's going to flip, I don't want to do anything to like upset that. I didn't know. I didn't want to mess it up. So I was like, I'm not going to focus too hard on that. I'm just going to let her do her thing. So I went to my 34 week appointment and my OB asked if I was worried about anything. And I said, well, I'm pretty worried about her being breached. I'm really hoping for an unmedicated vaginal birth if possible. And he was very supportive of that. I had switched OBs at about 21 weeks. There was nothing against my first OB. I just, there was a different one that I had done a few rotations with as a student nurse. And I remembered him and remembered that I would love to have him be my OB. And so anyways, I switched to him and he was very supportive of the way I wanted to deliver my baby. But he said, you know, I don't think we should worry about her being breached yet. There's always a chance she's going to flip. And so again, I kind of just waited. And he said at 36 weeks, we can have the ultrasound ready and we can take a look and see what position she's in. So at 36 weeks, I went in and he didn't have the ultrasound at bedside. So I'm like, well, that's weird. You know, I thought we were going to do an ultrasound. And I asked him about it and he was like, oh no, I think we'll do it at 37 weeks. And so, you know, looking back, of course, I'm like, I should have just really pushed to have it done at 36 weeks. Not that it would have made a huge difference, but, you know, just knowing a little bit in advance that she was still breached would have been nice. So anyways, I went in for my 37 week checkup. And what I was doing is, I was going to take maternity leave two weeks before she was due. And so she was due September 14th. And so I was working like every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in the month of August. And in order to see my OB, because at the clinic I was at, they kind of rotate with OBs and midwives. In order to see my OB, I needed to go on Mondays before work. So I worked from 10 in the morning to 10 at night. So I would go in for my appointment at 9 a.m. and then go to work and work from 10 to 10. So that was my plan at 37 weeks. I went in on a Monday and I went in at nine and he did have the little ultrasound there. So I was really excited. I was excited because I was going to get my cervix checked for the first time. And I was going to, you know, see her positioning and it was just exciting to make that mark of like 37 weeks, you know, I could technically go into labor and it would be okay at this point. So he did the ultrasound and he saw that she was still breech and I was super, super bummed. And I was just a little bit, felt a little bit defeated, but you know, he right away said we can schedule an ECV, an external cephalic version where they manually try to turn the baby because he knew that I really wanted to try for a vaginal birth. And so I said, okay, we can schedule that. And he was like, what about Wednesday? And I'm like, sure, we might as well do it. The sooner, the better. And then, you know, he continued to listen to her heartbeat because that's something they do at every appointment. And as he was listening, we both noticed that her heartbeat didn't sound like it normally did at all the other appointments. And so her heart was skipping every fourth beat and I could see it on the ultrasound and I could hear it and it was really scary. And I could tell he looked, I mean, he didn't look, you know, scared, but he just looked a little bit, you know, a little worried just because at every other appointment, her heart had been fine. So of course I instantly broke down and started crying and he said, okay, you know, we're not going to check you today. You know, I think that we just need to focus on what's going on. You know, babies can develop arrhythmias and oftentimes they'll go away, but I think you need to go to the labor and delivery unit and have an ultrasound with maternal fetal medicine and just get everything checked out. So I was still, you know, sobbing and I asked a few questions and then he called over to labor and delivery at the hospital I work at. So I left and of course my husband on this day was out on the ocean fishing with like no service. 
And I tried to call him and he didn't answer. So I called his dad who was with him and he didn't answer. And then luckily his sister's boyfriend was with them and he did answer. So I got a hold of my husband and I said, you know, I'm just crying and trying to blubber these words out. And I said, you know, she has an arrhythmia and she's breached and we have to schedule a version. I'm going to labor and delivery to have the ultrasound. And, you know, he was kind of stressed out because I was stressed out and he was like, okay, well, do I need to come home? And, you know, looking back, I probably just should have said, yes, you should come home because I'm 37 weeks pregnant and our baby has the heart arrhythmia. But I said, no, you know, just keep fishing. I'll keep you posted. I feel like I've heard so many stories like this, you know, even on your podcast, like so many women say, no, you don't need to come home. And in my head, I'm thinking, oh, but of course they do, because it's going to happen. You know, everybody knows it's going to happen. But when you're the one who is in the situation firsthand, you don't think that it's going to be you. You don't think your baby's going to come three weeks early. So especially because I wasn't even in labor at this point. And I don't know if I was dilated, but I hadn't had my cervix checked. I wasn't feeling contractions, maybe some Braxton Hicks, but I had no signs of labor. So I told my husband to stay and I called my charge nurse and said, Hey, you know, I'm not going to be able to come to work or, well, I actually said, I'm going to go have an ultrasound done, but I might be able to come to work afterwards because I wasn't sure what was going to happen. So I went to labor and delivery. I had a non-stress test and an ST. And so I was hooked up to the monitors and they were seeing that I was having contractions, but I wasn't feeling them. And then they could see baby's heart and the doctor came in and said, oh yeah, this isn't really anything exciting. It just looks like she's having PACs. So for anyone who doesn't know, PACs are premature atrial contractions. And I have had patients where I work who have had these before and they've not been super worrisome in the situations I've been in. So I thought, okay, you know, she's got some PACs, but the doctor doesn't seem super worried. So I'm not super worried. So I just continued to wait to go have my ultrasound. And, you know, I think an hour or so went by or maybe two and I went and had my ultrasound done. And the ultrasound tech, told me that my baby, well, her name is Rosemary, so I can call her Rosemary. She was posterior as well. I think that's sunny side up. So they couldn't see the structures of the heart as clearly as they needed to because of her positioning. So the tech was trying to find the images to show the doctor the heart so they could make sure everything was okay. But she was having some difficulties. And then she also said that my baby was measuring big. In this ultrasound, she was measuring at 8.8 pounds. And that's at 37 weeks. So that's pretty big. And she also, of course, uh, found that my fluid levels were low. And so she was telling me that, you know, they might not do the external cephalic version if your fluid levels are low and your baby's big. You know, I would just mentally prepare to maybe have a C section. And I have nothing against C-sections. I I have my sister had a C-section. I know many people who've had C-sections. It's not that I didn't want that because of, I guess what I'm saying is I more so just didn't want a C-section because I didn't want to go through the recovery process. I didn't want to go through, you know, surgery while being awake. And I really just wanted the natural experience if possible. And I wanted the chance for my body to be able to go into labor and do what it is supposed to do. So it was kind of frustrating to hear the tech tell me that I should mentally prepare for a C-section. So, you know, in my head, I'm like, well, she doesn't know what she's talking about. I'm not going to have a C-section. And so done with the ultrasound and I go back to the triage room and um, the poor gal next to me, because the only thing separating us was a curtain. She heard My entire day, she heard me go from happy to sad, happy to sad to crying to laughing. So she probably was wondering what the heck was going on. But I went back to the triage room and it was probably another two, three hours, two and a half hours till I heard anything. And I was just sitting there and my husband, you know, was checking in, but I was texting my best friend, Sydney. I was texting her like the whole day because 
she's the one who I said, who really helped me through pregnancy and, you know, just kind of motherhood in general. And so I was texting her the whole day and just telling her what was going on. And she's also a nurse. And so we were just brainstorming what we thought was going to happen. And, you know, I was waiting for the doctor to come in and I was getting really hungry because I hadn't eaten since like eight in the morning and I'm super pregnant. So I'm like, gosh, I really need something to eat. So I thought, you know, should I just leave? Like, should I just discharge myself? Did they forget about me? Because no one's been in here. And I feel like if it was a big deal, someone would have told me something. So one of the nurses came in and she was like, oh, you're still here. And I was like, yes, I'm still here. I have no idea what I'm waiting for. And uh, of course, I'm a nurse. So I understand that things take a while. But I also, being a patient, kind of was experienced it on the other end and was like, why is this taking forever? So she was like, well, I can bring you in a snack. And I was like, that would be great. So she brought me in a snack. And I think this was around maybe like 2.30 or 3 in the afternoon. So it's been quite a while. And I started eating the snack. And then she came back in like, I don't know, two minutes later. And she was like, actually, I'm going to need you to stop eating that snack. And I was like, okay, why? And she's like, well, your OB wants you to be NPO. So that means nothing by mouth. So basically they don't want me to eat. You know, as a nurse, I know that we typically do that with patients who are going to be undergoing surgery. So I was like, well, why? And she said, well, I think your doctor is talking about potentially delivering your baby today. And of course, in my head, I'm like, I don't even know what that means because I'm not in labor. My baby's breech. They haven't tried to turn her. I don't know how you would possibly think about delivering my baby today if I'm not labor. And she just let the doctor. So she left. So I'm sitting there. So I called my friend Sydney and I was like, I don't know what's going on. Like they're talking about a C-section. I just, I thought everything was fine. I haven't been talked to about anything. So we're both kind of freaking out and I was waiting to call my husband because again, I didn't want him to rush home if nothing was going to happen essentially. And I was just going to go back to work. So I waited a few more minutes and the doctor came in and she basically explained to me that my baby is measuring big and my fluid levels are low. So she's not super confident in trying to turn the baby. She also doesn't want to turn her under those circumstances you know, if it's really tight in there and they don't have much space to move her, if she also has a heart arrhythmia because they don't want to put her into distress. And the doctor was not sure if it was PACs or if her heart was fibrillating or what was going on because she had talked to a pediatric cardiologist at one of the bigger hospitals in Portland. And they were thinking that, you know, it could be something more going on in the heart, but they can't tell with the images from the ultrasounds. They really think that they should just get her out so that they can make sure everything's okay. So when she told me that, you know, I'm in shock, I'm shaking, I'm crying, I'm just really upset. And my first thought was, you know, I was thinking about the Know Your Options childbirth course. And I was thinking, I'm so glad that they put the C-section module in the beginning because we hadn't even finished the course yet, but luckily we had been through the (laughs) C-section. So I'm like, thank God, because if this is what I'm going to do, I want to know what my options are. Yeah. So I called my husband and I just said, Hey, what are you doing? And he said, I am going to stop and do some fishing on my way home from the beach because they were fishing on the ocean. And I said, well, you should probably just come to the hospital because we are going to have a baby. And he was like, what? Like, what's going on? And I was like, I know I need to update you on things, but, you know, I'm still crying. I'm still, you know, stressed out and shocked. So I tried to explain to him what was going on. And what I really appreciated about him was I had talked to him for eight and a half months. I had talked to him about how much I wanted a vaginal birth and how excited I was to go into labor. And It's funny, I tell people that and they're like, well, you're crazy, you know, like some people, not everyone. And I'm like, but no, I just was so excited. I thought about it all the time. And so I talked to him about it all the time. So he was really awesome. And he said, okay, now, are you sure that 
you need to have a C-section. You know, he wanted to take the second to kind of calm down and think about it and say, are you sure there's no other option? Are you sure that, you know, we can't wait? And so at that time I was already pretty worked up. So it was really hard for me to think about that and to process. And in my head, I'm like, I can't, I can't go on another three weeks with my baby having a heart arrhythmia that they can't figure out. You know, I'm not going to be able to live day by day and just be wondering if she's okay in there. So in an ideal world, you know, if she wasn't a big baby and my fluid levels weren't low, then they could have tried to turn her then that day and induced me. But, you know, I just kind of was thinking, yes, I want this birth experience, but more than that, I want a healthy baby. And if that means having a C-section today, then I guess that's, you know, what we need to do. So it wasn't an emergent C-section, but I mean, part of me, I look back and I'm like, well, I wonder why I couldn't have gone home and had some time to process and think and then come back the next morning, which is something I didn't even ask because I was so worried about her heart and they didn't have any answers. And so I was like, why would I postpone this? But, you know, thinking back, if I would have done that, I would have just stressed out the whole night anyways, because the nursery wasn't finished and I didn't have our bags packed and, you know, this, that, and the other. So it probably was a good thing that I didn't have time to think about it too long. But anyways, so I told my husband and he's like, okay, well, I'm going to rush home. You know, I'm going to drop my sister's boyfriend off at my parents' house. So he does that. He gets home. He says, mom, sister, I am going to the hospital. He is having C-section. Everything's okay, but don't ask questions. I have to leave. <laughs> he's a very blunt person. So he leaves, he goes to our house, he calls me and asks what I need. Meanwhile, the anesthesiologist is trying to talk to me and have me consent to the procedure. And they're trying to start an IV, which luckily was like not a problem. The nurse was awesome. And they're trying to ask me all these questions. And I'm trying to talk to my husband and trying to process. And it was really crazy. And so I had not packed my bags. I had the diaper bag packed, of course, with like seven different outfits for our baby, but I didn't have anything packed for us. And I just told my husband, I don't know what to bring. Also, I don't know what you should bring because I'm having C-section and I don't need my tux pads or my dermaplast or anything like that. So I guess just bring my robes and the camera and call it good. So he showered and he grabbed the stuff that we needed and he headed to the hospital. And while I was waiting for him, I had a couple of the nurses who kind of talked to me and I expressed to them my concerns and why I was so upset and that I really just really didn't want to have a C-section and that I wasn't quite ready to meet my baby, even though I thought I was, I was really nervous about being a mom. And, you know, I didn't have my time to prepare, my time to nest. Like I was in the mindset of, I just need to get through two more days of work and then I'm done. Because in my job, I work in the emergency department and it's really stressful and you're constantly going and you're constantly on edge and you're constantly just preparing for anything that could happen. And so I really didn't have time to sit and just prepare. I mean, I did throughout my pregnancy, but not for those two weeks that I was really hoping for to get the house ready and do grocery shopping and make freezer meals and, you know, all the stuff that I was thinking I was going to be able to do. It was all coming to a very quick close and I didn't even get to have the opportunity. So I was trying to talk to the nurses about that. And they were also trying to explain to me how a C-section works, which when I was a student nurse, I sat in on a C-section and I watched it. I knew that it was fast. I knew that you were usually awake, which I wanted to be awake. I wanted to do as gentle of a C-section as possible, which is something I learned from your childbirth course. And so I asked for the clear drape. I asked to not have my hands tied down, which they said, you know, we would only do that if you had to be put under, but we're just going to do spinal anesthesia for you. And I asked for immediate skin to skin, which was already protocol at that hospital. So that was nice. And delayed cord clamping was as well. And so, you know, I just kind of went over these things and tried to rack my brain for all the things that I learned and remembered and uh, tried to have as much control over the situation as I could. So my husband shows up at five o'clock, 5 p.m. 
And my baby was born at 626. So he got there. Granted, I told them, you know, we can't do this until he gets here. But that just goes to show how quick the process is as soon as they get started. So he got there at five. Uh, The doctor came in and talked with him and let him answer any questions. You know, we had a few minutes to just talk to each other and just, you know, he was really awesome. Like he just basically, I think he knew that he had to kind of have himself under control because I was really worried and really stressed. And he just said, you know what, we're going to meet Rosemary and we're going to be parents and it's going to be great. I'm really thankful I was able to have him there because with everything going on with COVID, there were some times throughout the pregnancy that I was like, well, what if they're not going to allow him to be there? But we had to wear our masks, but luckily he was allowed to be in the room with me at all times. So after that, they walked me, I walked to the operating room and my husband had to just wait outside for this part. They did the spinal anesthesia, which is the needle that goes into your spine and it numbs you from the waist down. And that was a really weird feeling having my entire lower half of my body numb. I feel like I was numb all the way up to about the bottom of my rib cage. And so I remember telling the anesthesiologist, I was like, this is terrible. I hate this feeling. Does anyone else hate this feeling? And uh, he said, yeah, most people do. (laughs) So they did the spinal anesthesia and they laid me down. They placed a Foley catheter because I wouldn't have control over my bladder while I was numb. And I wouldn't be able to, you know, get up and walk for a while to go to the bathroom. So then they let my husband come back and I was starting to get numb. And the process of getting numb is just the weirdest thing because they're cleaning me off and they're doing things. And I know that they're touching me and I know that they're moving my legs and stuff, but I can't feel it. So it was just really strange. So my husband was sitting at the head of the bed with me, kind of keeping me calm. And they kept telling me, if you feel nauseous at all, just let us know because we really don't want you throwing up because we don't want the potential of you aspirating. So I told them basically right then, I'm feeling nauseous. They gave me some nausea medication and I was really just trying to keep myself from kind of having like a panic attack because I felt like I couldn't breathe, even though I knew that I could and I could see my vital signs and I knew they were fine. But I was just really kind of panicky and I was really shaky, which I'd heard from other people's stories, but they get shaky too from the anesthesia and the adrenaline. But I was really shaky. And so I was really just trying to focus on my breathing. My husband was talking to me. The anesthesiologist was talking to me. And so the process was so fast. I don't know how fast, but I would say from the minute they started cutting to when she was out, gosh, it had to have been like five minutes. It was so quick. So they pulled her out, which was the weirdest sensation. And they dropped the drape. And we were able to see her be born. And I don't think she was crying right away, but I knew that she was okay because I could see her kind of moving and trying to start to cry. And so they were suctioning her just with that little bulb suctioner. And one thing I'm super bummed about is I didn't get to hold her. I didn't get her put on my chest. I didn't get to hold her. They brought her over, showed her to us really quick, and then they took her and they put her on CPAP which is a breathing machine for a few minutes. And I'm still not clear as to why that was. I think it was because, I don't know if she had a little bit of trouble breathing in the beginning. I mean, her APGAR scores were like eight and nine. So that tells me that she was fine, but I don't know if she had some troubles breathing and then combined with the heart arrhythmia, they were just worried. And, you know, she was also born early. I mean, she was right at 37 weeks. So she was barely full term. So. Anyways, I didn't get to hold her right away. They weighed her. She was seven pounds, 9.6 ounces. So she wasn't eight and a half pounds like they thought. She was still pretty big. She was 19 and three quarters inches long. And they took my husband back and he held her and they sewed me up. And then I went to the PACU, so the post anesthesia care unit. So basically, she was born at 626 and I got to hold her at I think 8.30. So it was two hours. So I felt kind of bummed I had missed the golden hour, kind of bummed I didn't get skin to skin right away and kind of bummed I didn't get to breastfeed right away. And I mean, everything I was obviously a little bummed about, but 
then I was also so happy because I had my baby and she was healthy and she was big and she, you know, turned pink and she was the cutest thing. And we were just really happy she was there and happy that she was healthy ultimately. So it was kind of a crazy feeling once she was finally, they brought her into my arms and, you know, I was crying and we got to hold her and be together as a family. And then I finally got to breastfeed her. And then we spent the whole evening. I mean, not the whole evening. Of course, we spent a ton of time just staring at her and loving on her. But we also spent much of the evening FaceTiming my family members because I have four older sisters and then my parents and then a lot of friends and then my husband's sister, my husband's parents. And nobody other than my husband's family knew that we were having a baby. I mean, none of my sisters, neither of my parents, because my sisters was really sick at the time that this was going on. She had viral meningitis and she was in the hospital and my mom was staying with her and she wasn't at that hospital. She was at a different one, but I really didn't want to bother my family with anything if nothing was going to come from the day. So I didn't tell them I was going in for an ultrasound. I didn't tell them that she had a heart arrhythmia. I was going to wait till the end of the day to update them all in our family group text because I didn't really want a million questions when I didn't know what was going on. And I didn't want to have, you know, more scary news going on when my sister was so sick. So I kind of just waited. But then when they told me I was having a C-section, I was in no state of mind to tell anyone that what was going on other than my husband. So I didn't tell my family until after she was born. So once she was born, we basically FaceTimed them each individually and just showed them to her. And they were all so excited and so confused, but so excited and just really happy to see her here. So that was basically how it went. It was kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, like a whirlwind day, I'm sure. And then how was your recovery? I mean, COVID going on and everything else. Yeah. My recovery was, it was good. I mean, it was definitely hard to recover from a surgery, especially just being pregnant and then having surgery and then having a baby. It was really hard. My husband was awesome. He was really helpful. And so were the nurses. They were really great. I needed a lot of help getting out of bed once the spinal anesthesia wore off. It was really painful. It was really painful. I mean, I was, of course, in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to try to just take Tylenol and ibuprofen. I don't want to take any pain medication because, you know, I don't want it to make the baby tired and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it got to the point where my husband's like, you're not going to enjoy your time with her here in the hospital because you're in so much pain. You just need to take medication. So they did give me some oral pain medication that really helped. And I was on that the whole time I was in the hospital, which Luckily, it didn't make me feel loopy or anything. And I mean, Rosemary, my daughter was sleepy, but I mean, she was a newborn. She was sleepy regardless. So I don't think it had much of an effect on her either. So that was really nice. But yeah, I mean, the first time I stood up, it felt like my insides were falling out. I mean, it was pretty difficult trying to do things. And emotionally, it was hard too, because when we got home, I wanted to do things for her. I wanted to get up and change your diaper. And I wanted to be active because I'm just an active person. And I was on this high of like, I just had my baby, but yeah, I really had to focus on trying to rest and recover. And even now, you know, I'm eight weeks, I think, yeah, eight weeks postpartum, but I'm lucky enough to feel well enough to be back at the gym a couple times a week and going on walks and I feel good. But even now I have to remind myself that I need time to still rest and let my body fully recover. Yeah, you're definitely still still in the thick of that fourth trimester. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, I feel like you did a great job of mentioning resources throughout your story, but do you want to just cover those again really quickly here at the end? Yeah, so your podcast, of course, was my number one thing I listened to all the time. The Know Your Options Childbirth Course. Ina May Gaskin, she wrote the book, Ina May's Guide to Childbirth. It's a little crunchy. I'm sure you've heard that before. Yeah. There are definitely <laughs> some things that I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. But it was just, there's so many positive experiences that it was really nice to listen to those. 
I also read Rebecca Decker's book. It's called Babies Are Not Pizzas. They're Born Not Delivered. And that was really awesome to just kind of read and get her perspective. She has a lot of great insight. The other thing that I was going to mention was the NARA Baby Tracker app. This I didn't experience until just like a few weeks ago. But what happened was when we were in the hospital, so I had a great, great breastfeeding experience. And even now still, I'm still breastfeeding and you know, I loved every bit of it, but she dropped down 10% of her body weight. So she dropped down to six pounds, 14 ounces. And so we were really worried. And I know it's common for babies to drop weight, but she just got really small. And so we're doing this like three-step feeding program. And so we were trying to keep track of that where I would breastfeed and then I would give her to my husband. My husband would bottle feed some of my breast milk while I pumped. And it's a very long process, but it was to put weight on her. And so she ended up gaining her weight back. But in order to track that, we were using the NARA Baby Tracker app. And I don't know, some people think I'm crazy, but I'm still using the app. It allows me to track which breast I feed her from and for how long. It allows me to track if she has poopy versus wet diapers and when. It allows me to track my pumping sessions and how much I pump, but also allows me to track her height, weight, and any vaccines she might have, her temperature. It's just, I don't know. It's been awesome for me, especially now trying to, not that you can really establish much of a routine at eight weeks, but trying to keep track of when I'm feeding her and when she might be hungry next and you know how my supply is doing. It's been super awesome. So that was one thing I didn't mention that I just wanted to touch on, but I think those were most of my resources. I wrote them down here. Um, oh, I also read the book, The Fourth Trimester, which was also a great resource to me. So All right, well, we'll put all those links on the show notes page. And then did you want to share where people can connect with you online? Yeah, so I'm mainly on Instagram, which my handle is Hannah, H-A-N-N-A-H underscore Wild Hover, W-I-L-D-H-A-B-E-R. I'm also on Facebook under Hannah Wild Hover. And then my email is Harder, so that's H-A-R-D-E-R, dot hannah at gmail.com. And so if anyone wants to reach out or have any questions or anything, feel free. I'm pretty active on all of those. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing today. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Bryn. It's been awesome. All right. Now I'm going to talk to Ashley from Motif Medical all about their new battery operated Luna breast pump. Hi, Ashley. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Motif Medical and their breast pumps. Thanks for having me, Bryn. Can you tell my listeners a little bit about you and your background? Sure. So my background is actually in nutrition, and I worked for WIC as a nutrition educator for a while and then um, became an IBCLC in about 2017. I started my own business uh, at that time, probably just prior to getting my certification, just doing breastfeeding classes and and, uh, support groups, things like that. I had my own little girl in 2015 and breastfed her for almost three years. So I have different perspectives kind of coming in from all angles and backgrounds when it comes to breastfeeding and support needed and that sort of thing. When I revamped and kind of got a little bit more tech savvy with, you know, better promoting my my own personal business, I was able to come in contact with um, Motif Medical. And they reached out wanting someone that kind of sees eye to eye with them as far as similar goals and similar outreach and their approach is very similar to what I try to do. And that's trying to make breastfeeding feel more like something anybody can accomplish. You know, you don't have to be super granola or (laughs) uh, anything like that to to want to breastfeed and breastfeed as long as you want um, or pump exclusively or, you know, anything like that. You know, they try to meet the mom where they're at and kind of give it more of a modern approach, which I, that really, really speaks to me. So I've been working with them for a little over a year and a half now as their lactation director. And a lot of their blogs and information that's more medically geared or a little bit more um, in depth with lactation is written by yours truly. So it's a great collaboration and it's been an awesome journey working alongside them. It's a great team. 
Very cool. Yeah, I love all the content they're putting out to help educate as well. And so it's cool to know that you're behind that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they always collaborate and come up with topics that are relevant. And a lot of it is generated by questions from consumers and people looking to get a better pump and that sort of thing. So it's the questions coming from the source. So I know that, you know, by answering those things, you know, I'm answering things that are important to people that are reading it. Yeah, definitely. So you mentioned making breastfeeding, you know, a little bit less daunting and more accessible. And I think that one of the big components when it comes to breastfeeding, obviously there's so much around getting the latch and milk supply and all that established in the beginning. But I also think that pumping is really overwhelming. It's this crazy contraption that you've never used before. You feel like you're, you know, being hooked up to like a dairy cow machine. (laughs) So what are some of the things you really like moms to know about pumping before they, you know, if they've never used one before? So I think being more acquainted with your pump is important. Mm -hmm. And that's if you can get one while you're still pregnant and you don't have the burden of trying to figure out motherhood, you know, a new baby is very overwhelming, even if it's your second or third or fourth, you know, if you got a new pump, take it out of the box, play around with it, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But something I really want to stress is if you don't have a pressing need to pump, you don't have to pump right away. And I think having a pump or being given a pump while you're still in the hospital setting, perhaps, whatever the case may be, it's kind of like, well, it's there. Maybe I'm supposed to be using it. Mm-hmm. And then those questions of, well, how often and how long and should it fit a certain way? Should I use a certain strength? It just opens up a can of worms of all these questions. So I think first and foremost is be familiar with your pump if you have to use it and then figure out if you even need to use it in that time and not be afraid to ask questions when it is time to bring out the pump. There are people like myself who are at the ready to answer those kinds of questions and it is so okay to ask. It's not a stupid question to ask about when and how and how often and all those sorts of things. It's very important to ask. Yeah, definitely. And I think that what you said about getting familiar with it even before baby is born is great just because there's so many pieces and you might actually take the time to read the directions and get all the parts put together properly versus, you know, sleep deprived postpartum and getting things in the wrong place. But I know for me, I didn't really, you know, truly pump until I went back to work. So Do you have any suggestions for people that are planning to be, you know, spending time away from their baby and needing to pump for that reason, as far as like introducing the pump, like how much should you, you know, have stored and when should you start using it and that kind of thing? Absolutely. I think that's a pretty anxiety inducing kind of thought process for many moms if they're not sure how to go about that. So if you know when you're going to be returning to work or know when you're going to be separated, uh, maybe you're traveling and not bringing baby with you for whatever reason. I think it's good to kind of have a plan of action, Mm -hmm. but not let it overwhelm you. I think we're all guilty of going on Pinterest or Googling and seeing um, freezers that are just packed full of stored milk and thinking that's the gauge, that's the rule of thumb of what you have to have in order to be away from your baby and be successful with pumping. And that's not the case. So I think if you have a good week, two weeks ahead of when you are going to be away, that's a great time to start storing or to start beginning that pumping process. You don't have to do it from day one. You know, as soon as you have baby, if you're going back to work three and four months down the road, you know, start a week or two before you have to go. Depending on how well you respond to a pump, you might get away with only having to pump once or twice a day. And is it better to pump after baby eats or? That's a very common question. Um, I... I think the best time is number one, first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then if baby's still asleep, go ahead and pump. Mm -hmm. But everybody's different. So the biggest thing to keep in mind is a lactating breast is never truly empty. Mm -hmm. And so emptied breasts, as in expressed breasts, make more milk faster. Right. Supply and demand. (laughs) Exactly. So, you know, you don't have to feel super full to know that you still have milk. And so a pump is not going to completely drain you. Mm -hmm. And if baby acts hungry and you've already pumped, you can still put baby to breast and offer to nurse. Baby's going to get things out that the pump can't. And you're already replenishing what you've pumped out too. So you've got that going for you too. So trying to just take a deep breath and not overthink that 
part of it of, of the before after baby is fed, I think is very important too. You know, it's just keep in mind you've got more there than what you were able to pump out. And something else to keep in mind too is, you know, you, you may be pumping for storage purposes, but you're going to need a pump even while you're away. So mm-hmm. that's going to be going to your to your stash as well. And that's for health purposes too. You can't be going, you know, four more hours without pumping or expressing. So, you know, keep in mind too, that that's going to be adding to your stash. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, as far as amounts needed, um, a baby that's under six months of age uh, averages about um, an ounce for every hour of the day. And now they may go two and three hours in between feeds. So that means they take in two to three ounces of feeding. Mm-hmm. So you can use that calculation to figure out how many ounces you need. If you're away for um, an eight hour work day and it takes you 30 minutes to go to work and 30 minutes to get back, that's nine hours away from baby. So you need approximately nine to 10 ounces of milk. It's not a lot when you break it down like that. It can kind of take the pressure off mom to, to, to have all of that prepared. Yeah, definitely. And I think that your point about pumping in the morning is so good because it can get really discouraging if you're not pumping as much in the evening. And so seeing those full bottles in the morning is good motivation, I think, to keep pumping. That's a great point. It kind of sets the day off Mm -hmm. to a very productive start. Yeah. So what have you seen with the Motif Luna? I've used this pump and I've used a lot of breast pumps over my three kids. And this has been by far my favorite. I just feel like it's super efficient. It's a million times quieter than some of the other ones I've used. And I find the flanges are really comfortable, but you've talked to a lot of moms that have used it. So what are you hearing about it and noticing yourself? Well, honestly, I'm hearing a lot of the same thing. Um, yeah. Moms are loving how quiet it is. I know that it's kind of distracting enough when you're, you're trying not to think about the fact that you're pumping, you're trying to relax, you're trying to, you know, maybe change your mindset on what's going on Mm -hmm. so that you can have a better output. A quiet engine really helps that. And and the fact that it's still strong enough to double pump. And what I mean by that, if listeners aren't familiar with that term, this engine can keep up strength-wise having both hoses hooked up. So we, you know, we typically think of uh, strength power and it makes sense that once that strength has been divided into two tubes versus it all going into one tube, Mm -hmm. if you're just pumping one side or the other, that it might lower a little bit. Mm -hmm. But what I've seen is it, it doesn't affect whether you pump one side at a time or both sides at a time. And so moms are spending less time pumping and they're getting milk out with this pump that they're not necessarily getting out with other, other pumps that they may have tried if they've had that opportunity to compare. Um, so I think that's pretty remarkable to point out is this engine keeps up no matter if you're single or double pumping. Yeah, I've very, noticed very that I, I can finish in about 10 minutes versus maybe 20 with other pumps. And by 20 minutes, my nipples were pretty uncomfortable. So I'm yeah. grateful for that faster pumping yeah. time for sure. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I hear that a lot. 10, 15 minutes, most moms are done. And mm-hmm. I mean, I don't even notice. Average. Like I realize, oh, nothing's <laughs> coming out anymore because I've been like, you know, checking emails or something. Yeah. Oh, I turn this thing off. <laughs> so it's like a really efficient baby, which is really hard to mimic. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good stuff. Um, any tips for, I mentioned that the flanges are really comfortable for me on the motif. I don't know if I just mm-hmm. lucked out, you know, trying the best fit, but Any tips for that? If people are feeling like maybe they don't have a good fit, what should they be looking for? Yeah. um, So I teach the the I love you sign with your hands, you know, the thumb, the index finger, and the pinky. Mm -hmm. And the pinky being the the smaller size, it's usually around a 21 millimeter. If your nipple is larger than that and you think you might need to go a size up, you're feeling any pinching feelings or rubbing, that sort of thing, uh, go, go a size up. You know, try a 24 millimeter or something like that. The 27 is indicative of like the thumb size. So we think 27 for the thumb, 24 for the index finger, and 21 for the pinky. And so use that to measure the diameter of your nipple. And if you see a bunch of rubbing going on on the narrower part of the flange, it's time to to move up a size. Or even down a size if you're getting too much breast tissue. If if it's clamping on the areola, you're actually kinking that hose, if you will, Mm -hmm. um, if too much tissue is being gathered in there or if there's a lot of rubbing going on. So playing around with different sizes if you need to. Maybe even use a lubricant. I know some people use like a nipple balm or Mm -hmm. coconut oil or something like that. And putting and it actually on the flange, not just your nipples is something I learned, which I did not know with my first (laughs) puppy experience. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I really appreciate you sharing that tip as well, because that is a great little word of advice. 
some moms are just a little bit more sensitive or maybe they're kind of in between sizes. Maybe they've got some fluctuations going on, maybe babies with cluster feeding. There's different reasons why you might be experiencing um, just a little bit more discomfort in times and not in others. So, you know, that's a great tool to have in your toolbox to, to make things a little bit more comfortable. Something else you can think about, too, is measuring each individual nipple. I've had plenty of moms that have to use two different sizes. So, oh, you know, yeah, good point. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're sisters. They're not twins. So, you know, yeah. make sure that you have the right size for each nipple. Yeah, you're an individual. Always remember that. Yeah, I've, I think that that really goes to the, uh, the whole thing where people always talk about one side produces more milk, too. Yeah. It's just so interesting. And mine's been that way with three kids. It's always been the right <laughs> side is my big producer. So. The super boob. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sisters, not twins. And what's interesting, too, just a little side note there is with every pregnancy, the VLI, the organs that actually store your milk, mm -hmm. um, get bigger and more numerous with each pregnancy. Oh. So that it could probably stand to say that we lactate a little bit easier with each pregnancy. Yeah. And it comes in faster, at least for me. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this great advice with us. And then if you want to send any of your favorite articles you've written, I would love to link to those on the show notes page as well. Yeah, absolutely. We've got some great ones coming out. We're covering the battery powered Luna um, and all of the great uh, versatility and conveniences that that offers without sacrificing, you know, strength and, and all of that good stuff. So be on the lookout and I will send those links over to you. Yeah. I'm so excited for the battery powered version because that's just like the one thing that Motif didn't have. They have the smaller handheld battery one, but getting this, mm -hmm. like you said, the full powered Luna with the battery right. operating right. is really yeah. nice. It looks exactly Larger the body. same. So we were talking yeah. about it before we started recording that there's not really any differences other than it's more convenient. So that's Exactly. Great. Tote it around with you. And if you've got other kiddos and you need to follow them around from room to room, you don't have to unplug or you know anything like that. There's just so many possibilities with this new option. I love that Motif has once again given us another option for our moms. Yeah. And the Luna is already like smaller and more lightweight than a lot of pumps. So I think having right. a battery operated version just makes sense too, because it's so portable right. already. It's perfect sense. Perfect sense. All right. Well, thank you so much again for chatting with me today, Ashley. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much again to Hannah for sharing her birth story with us and to Motif Medical for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget to head over to motifmedical.com slash birth hour for more information about everything they have to offer. If you want more information from today's episode, you can head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Hannah's name in the search bar. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.